Noam Dromi is the EP creator on Dispatches from Quarantine and the executive producer on Saturday Night Seder. Also representing the Saturday Night Seder is Ben's Benj Pasek. He's the creator and Broadway songwriter. Aaron Blair is a producer for Conan and the Team Coco podcasts. And Raj Kapoor is executive producer and creative director for the Disney Family Singalongs 1 and 2 and the 2020 Graduate Together. Thank you so much for joining us. Raj, if you could, could you walk us through the prep process and uh, what that was like on the singalongs? Um, the singalongs were a very quick process. <laughs> so by the time we, we had a little pre-production meeting over the weekend and Monday morning, April 6th was green light. Uh, by the end of the day, we probably had 50 to 60 people engaged on our teams because we knew how fast we had to make this and we delivered to ABC on the 16th. So from green light to broadcast was 10 days with us, you know, kind of delivering on that 10th day in the morning. Um, so it was, it was fast and furious and it's like the format didn't exist and our, the talent wasn't booked. It was all just go like Monday morning. It was go and start making it. And we were literally shooting four days later with, with certain segments. We have a very diverse audience. Uh, just to put it in perspective, what would prep on a show like this have been uh, pre COVID? I mean, I think, you know, you can turn around stuff fast, but like four to six weeks maybe and putting together some small ideas and having maybe a creative discussion every three days and then bringing more people into the team. And this was like, I don't know, you have to make it in 10 days because this is when ABC wants it. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. You know, again, I think timeline is just going to be a theme that we keep coming back to because throughout this process, um, you know, the, the, um, Readiness to get it on the air quickly, I think, has a huge influence on how things are being produced and the tools that are being used. Um, so after such a, a quick prep, can you share kind of some of the things that caught you by surprise or, or things that you just couldn't have anticipated? I mean, it was, it was just, it was all a learning process. Like the Disney family sing-alongs and the Graduate Together special it's just a learning process and it's like it, you get a bunch of people together you come up with creative ideas and there's no time to backtrack it's just like you keep moving the train forward it's like oh no we're going to pitch this this is going to be a virtual environment we're getting these portraits from you know jr the artist you're just you're making stuff constantly and you're working really hard and your days are long and it's just it's it's a really amazing creative process but you're doing it all remotely so it's just you know you're you're depending on a bunch of other people doing their stuff all from their homes and very little interaction you know with with in person at all yeah it's such an important part of what we do as as we've been speaking about and uh and something that we all certainly yearn for Aaron, what were the discussions at Conan, you know, regarding continuing to shoot through this uh, shutdown? You know, I, I'm, when we spoke earlier, you, you mentioned kind of even the similarities back to when you produced shows during the writer's strike. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the late night format is interesting because you're doing a show every day. Uh, so, um, you know, for the most part, you're moving very fast and things are fluid anyway. Um, and I think, you know, we're extremely fortunate because Conan since the beginning in 93 has done remotes, a lot of remote shooting. Uh, and then, you know, these past few years, we've been doing these Conan Without Borders shows and going around the world and figuring out, you know, so, um, you know, I'm with Conan uh, in Ghana and having to figure out how to shoot, you know, 19 things at once with uh, my fellow producer, Ruthie Wyatt. And so, um, you know, I think we were really fortunate in, in the way that our team is full of, you know, very motivated, intelligent, uh, creative, tech savvy people to begin with. Um, and so, you know, when, you know, quarantine hit and, and we had to kind of figure out how to do that, it, Conan was, he wanted to shoot it by himself at his house. Um, and honestly, one of the biggest challenges was, uh, teaching Conan how to do that. <laughs> um, and, but he's smart, you know, the guy, the guy uh, went to Harvard, so he picked it up, but that was a big challenge. And, and then, you know, how do you, uh, our editors, of course, ha have home rigs and these things. And, 
and, and that was, of course, the scramble to get it going. And, you know, a lot of people have spoken tonight about putting systems in place as you move forward and then kind of transitioning uh, in, into larger systems that maybe can carry us further afield. But um, yeah, I mean, initially, and, and same thing with the podcast, you know, with Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend and all of our podcasts, you know, again, we were lucky to have such a, we're lucky to have such a great team that everybody was all hands on deck. And, and I think to a certain extent, you know, uh, many of us relish the challenge. I think we really, that's something I personally love about working on the show um, is the fact that um, we are allowed a lot of autonomy in terms of figuring things out and getting to do all different kinds of projects. So, you know, when you're talking about Conan and Team Coco, you're talking about the show, you're talking about the Team Coco Podcast Network, you're talking about our digital series that we do, even just clipping the show, all these different, you know, a whole uh, smorgasbord, if you will, of, of, of creative endeavors that, you know, we, we found a way to kind of do all of that in quarantine. You know, we shifted our digital series, um, Sona Fixes Your Life and Jordan's Opinions on Opinions to do, to kind of segue into quarantine content and, and those kinds of things. And um, yeah, so I, I think it was a challenge, but again, like the writer's strike and, and like remote shooting and Kona Without Borders and all of our live streaming, um, you know, I, I think to a certain degree, a, a lot of us kind of took up that that challenge um, with a lot of gusto because again, the, the big difference between late night and a lot of other formats is just the grind, the daily grind of doing a show every single day. And in many ways, you know, we look well before quarantine, we would look for ways to break things up and kind of flip the format on its head and do all these other things. And and so in a certain sense, quarantine was just another way for us to, to figure out how to do something in a different manner. Uh, so, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think in some ways our community, particularly those of us who work freelance, you know, have, have some tools in their toolbox to kind of roll with this stuff. You know, uh, some of us work seasonally, some of us anticipate being off. And, you know, so maybe that means that we've got some savings put aside to get us through times like this. I think in some ways the late night shows in particular, because you're doing a strip show every day, you know, um, I, I think that's an interesting consideration uh, as you make content day in and day out, and then you just have to flip the script. You guys had to put out contact, content almost immediately. I mean, all of the late night shows were, were really, you know, off the air for just a few days. Um, you know, the project that I did from green light to shooting was five days. And I spent a lot of those five days talking to other productions who were, who were doing it. And I think, I think I find it really interesting and novel. And, and as a fan of Conan, uh, you know, I think it's right on brand that, you know, he's shooting it at home with his iPhone, you know, when other people are parking, you know, sat trucks in their lawn. Right. And, uh, uh, so. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say, you know, um, obviously having worked there for 20 years, I obviously uh, love working there and, and Conan and Jeff Ross, our EP um, are just the best. And, and one thing I think that's really, you know, throughout uh, my entire two decades of working for Conan and Jeff, it's, there's always been this mentality of let's try it. Let's try it. I don't know. Let's try it. Um, and I think that, you know, Conan is always hungry and, and Jeff, we're always hungry for innovation and always hungry, you know, We've, we were really the tip of the spear when it came to live streaming um, a decade ago. And so I think that serves us very well then in a time like this, because Conan was like, I want to shoot it myself. I don't know. Let's try it. Let's try it. You know, and so that it's such a great mantra and such a great lesson for all of us working underneath them to, to have that attitude instead of, oh no, how do we do what we've been doing before the same way? How do we re... I don't know. Let's try something new. Let's try it. Who knows? It's, know? uh, it's so important that we're all making the same show, you know, um, in, in the broadest sense. And, and sometimes, yeah. you know, when, when that's out of sync, it, it tends to show up on camera. Right. And, and I think also, you know, it's a thing too of, um, you know, as a viewer, I appreciate when the, the, what I'm watching uh, changes things also, you know, and when there's attention to detail and those things as well. So I, um, yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's, I, I think, 
I feel very lucky because of our team. And, you know, we're all such nerds anyway. I mean, I had just a ring light at my house that I was like, here, man, here's a tripod, here's a ring light, you know, like, so it, it was, it's a very, and, and again, the, it's very, um, uh, you know, like the last panelists were talking about too, I think there is a certain sense of camaraderie that happens, you know, entertainment is a very, uh, you know, many of us are, are gregarious and like talking to one another and making connections and that stuff. And so you really, the, it's these times that you kind of, it, it's really nice to be able to come together as a team and like, let's guys, let's figure this out, you know, go team kind of a thing. It, 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 it's a really, in terms of morale, especially during, you know, uh, quarantine, morale can get very low and you're, we're all alone by ourselves uh, or with the voices in our heads, if you're talking about me. And I think that it's nice to feel that camaraderie again, even if it's separate. So being able to all come together and figure out a project and work in that, in, in that capacity, I think is great. Absolutely. Noam and Benj, you know, uh, Saturday Night Seder was a very, very ambitious and technical show. Um, could you walk us through just some of the tech side? I mean, you know, uh, take us through the prep process, the timeline, and then maybe some of the tech that you used uh, during that. And, and please get into as much detail as you like. What was the video village set up? You know, how did you guys all communicate during the shooting? Sure, and Chris, just quickly to um, set something up. Um, you know, I am uh, the head of the content studio for a, a Jewish nonprofit called Reboot. And I think when quarantine sort of happened, one of um, uh, our executive leadership's sort of immediate mandate was uh, we want to support artists um, people who stopped touring, if they were musicians or had live theater shows or they were comedians, other creative practitioners. And, you know, they were able to coalesce from their funders um, some money immediately to do that. And we have, you know, the good fortune having uh, within our membership ranks, you know, someone like Benj Pasek, you know, uh, Oscar, Tony and Grammy winner, someone who I have been a huge fan of. So just the idea of getting to collaborate with him on sort of a reinterpretation of a seminal Jewish holiday and creating that um, was, was such a privilege to be able to do. I'd like to say, you know, just taking bragging rights, I think we beat Sing Along by five days because we were up April 11th. Um, so we were fortunate in being able to do that first, obviously, because we had, you know, the realities of, of Passover when that was happening. I'll have Ben sort of walk us through the particulars in a way, um, you know, because this is one of those things where we had to be conscious, of course, of um, we weren't drop shipping equipment to people. We had to be mindful of very limited time to sort of have a tech rehearsal and a dress rehearsal. And then more specifically, I'll also be cognizant of the inefficiencies of different connection speeds and other variables that I know everyone is dealing with. But I'll let Ben sort of overview the technical side of it from there. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, yeah, it was a crazy project. So I, I come from the world of theater and uh, I've done some film and TV as well. Uh, but when Broadway shut down and everybody in New York got Corona, including me, uh, we were all kind of thinking like, what, what can we do in this time, especially the, pa the Passover holiday, it says, I'm so Jewy talking about this right now, but the Passover holiday is really all about going from, uh, going from confinement to freedom, going from winter to spring, going from a place of slavery to a place of freedom. And it felt like um, everybody was literally trapped inside their apartments. And so we wanted to create some content that was about this metaphoric moment that we were all going through and try to create something that felt communal. Um, so it really started, uh, and I'll get to the technical, but I'm just giving a quick setup of how it began. I saw a tweet uh, from a friend of mine who was like, I guess we're doing virtual Passover this year, like in the middle of March. And so I was like, I guess we are, like, let's do it. So um, from that, you know, I was randomly texting with a friend who's a you know, comedy writer. And it basically was like creating a show in theater camp where you're like, we're going to put on a show and we're going to do it in like a week. Um, but we kind of got this ragtag team of, you know, Jews and lovers of Jews who basically uh, became like a writer's room to create this hour long special. Um, and uh, then we had to figure out a lot of technical uh, components to it. So um, we, you know, did everything from uh, figuring out how to, you know, zoom while a star was, uh, you know, using their iPhone to record stuff. Um, or if people were having back and forth, we use this thing called StreamYard. But like, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm primarily a writer. I've never, you know, produced anything in this vein before. So discovering all of these mediums was completely new to me. And we also wrote original music for it as well. So the writing process also took place over Zoom, over calls, literally someone at the piano, 
someone writing lyrics at the same time in Google Docs and creating like this entire variety special. Um, and so in the technical elements of that too, like we had to record each piece one by one, and I'm sure this is true with the Disney sing-along and how, how that all went. Um, we, just, <laughs> we just did it as like people who, uh, you know, were doing it on our own. But, um, you know, figuring out how do we get, uh, we, we wrote an original song and then we would send it to like an arranger and be like, okay, like make something of this. And then we would send it to like one singer who would then take that recording and then we would send that to the next singer and they would put it in their earphone and then they would send it to the next singer. So it all kind of compiled on each other. And then we extracted the audio file, sent it to a mixer, sent it back. So it was really like making it up on the go um, and, you know, piecing this whole thing together. And then also from an editing standpoint, Again, you know, we, we created this and then we sort of re reverse engineered and brought it to YouTube to be a platform um, because we could raise money on that platform. And we, we, we thought we were gonna raise like maybe, you know, $25,000 and we raised $3.5 million for the CDC Foundation, which was a really amazing, you know, Jews were feeling the love and wanting to give money um, to this thing. But in terms, of, uh, in terms of like all of those technical elements, you know, they came together very last minute we ended up hiring different editors for literally each segment of this thing because we didn't have an overall editor to figure it out because we just didn't have the time. So we would look up people from like the BuzzFeed world or the Teen Vogue world who make these kinds of fun BuzzFeedy videos. And each one of them would take a different segment and then we kind of spliced it all together and tried to make a big old TV special. It's incredibly inspiring. I mean, I think, I, I think that's, you know, there is this misconception that you just mail an actor an iPhone and it's all, you know, they're going to take care of everything. Um, right. Raj, I'd like to talk a little bit about just, you know, the talent's role in these projects and how they are elevated. When you've got somebody like Derek Huff and, and uh, Kenny Ortega, you know, coming to the table, Ariana Grande, I mean, you know, these individual segments, they really feel like the, the artist's signature is on the work that they're doing. Uh, I can't imagine that was, uh, you know, that that was accidental. Yeah, I mean, to produce that much content, I mean, hours worth of content with 14 or 15 performances in 10 days, we really looked to collaborators. And like all, every show that we've worked on so far, like both ABC shows and The Graduate Together and even the YouTube show that was on the weekend, people have all come to the table. Like they've all put their best foot forward. They've been creative. They, there's been some amazing choreography. There's been some amazing musical direction and arrangements that have happened. And, you know, like as producers, we've given people the framework and the guidelines and helped them with tools and delivered camera kits that have been sanitized. And we've had people on standby in case they've had technical questions and we've been producing on Zoom and, you know, Hamish Hamilton's been directing from London and like all these kind of ways of working have changed and it's been like that for our online sessions and, but the whole idea of creating in quarantine has all been about collaboration and creative and effort by this whole mass of super talented people that, you know, basically stop working. And then all of a sudden you're asking them to think differently. And it's like, no, no, you're really great at editing and you're really great at music, you know, arrangements and stuff. And we need, you know, like just, it's, it's kind of like an all hands on deck approach to making television. And I don't know, it's, it's been really fun. It's been an amazing learning experience. And, and I feel like everybody's coming out of this with even a better skill set and a different way of working. And now maybe when we get all the tools like, like that we normally have access to, we can also depend on these new tools and these new ways of working that we've learned during this time. So I'm kind of excited to see what's going to happen when we're back and what that new kind of elevated platform is going to be, because I think all of us are a little bit better at doing our jobs and we're all a little bit better at communicating and we're all a little bit better with having our hands tied. So sure. like, let's see what we make next. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, I, completely, I completely agree. I was going to say it does feel like to a certain extent, like working out with ankle weights on, but creatively. <laughs> and then when we, we, we actually have access to like Warner Brothers opens back up or whatever, you know, it's going to be really exciting to see everyone has, honed such a sharp edge to their their creative blade to see then uh, what we carry forward out of this this ambitious ambition that we're seeing is is really really inspiring but no i have to say you know everybody's continuing to work on projects and i know everyone on the panel has projects that are in development and and we can't necessarily talk about but you have not stopped you're just making show after show after show 
Uh, can you tell us about the uh, sure. about your late night last week? Absolutely. Um, I, I'll actually, if you don't mind, Chris, just talk about two things. One of the other projects that we're particularly proud of is called Dispatches from Quarantine. And I think the idea there is I'm part of having launched an initiative called Silver Screen Studios, which is sort of a digital platform whose entire um, content strategy is around really compelling documentaries about badass seniors, older adults, people in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and 100s who are still out and active. Um, you know, we uh, spoke to an amazing 102-year-old woman who just started a jewelry business and, and set up an Etsy store. Um, but we were traveling around the country to talk to a lot of these people. And then once quarantine hit, um, we sort of had to pivot. And we just said, you know, who, how do we figure this out? If we talk about some of the challenges, whether it's with Conan or some of the people that Bench had to navigate in terms of technical Luddites, imagine an 80-year-old trying to get them on a, on a format and, and be able to see us and hear us. Um, so we just figured out an easy way to do it through Zoom. And I was amazed at the people who their generosity of spirit through contacts we had or access to a manager or a caretaker, Larry King, Ellen Burstyn, Carl Reiner, Tommy Chong, Norman Lear, um, already now, because it's important to us in terms of the work that we're doing, expanding the conversation and really being of the moment. We're talking to Harry Balafonte in a couple of weeks. We're talking to John Lewis, you know, just really to have a deeper understanding of some of these issues that are going on. And that format has been amazing because not only is it fun content and we're going deep in the well for great archival material, but also AARP has already said, we want to air this on our platform. We, want, we look at it as educational materials and things of that nature. And equally as importantly, we knew that older people were disproportionately impacted by social isolation, by COVID. So we've also started now, mind you, nowhere near as much as Benj has incredibly raised for the CDC Foundation, but we're starting to raise funds for those nonprofits that are really focused on seniors and what they're dealing with with this space. Um, last week was the, or two weeks ago, was the Jewish holiday of Shavuot, um, which celebrates when Moses came down and gave the Ten Commandments to the Israelites and, and that great uh, narrative of the Jewish diaspora. Um, so we did a project called Dawn. Dawn was an 11 hour live stream, three separate channels of content. So 33 hours of content um, that I was the technical director and the executive producer for. We did that in vMix, OBS, Zoom, StreamYard, uh, Skype, trying to figure out how to make all that work. We had a cloud-based solution that realized that, you know, we'd, we'd, have, we'd have had individual trucks for each kind of channel pod if we were doing this in the real world, but all that was happening in the cloud. We had a staff of 11 in four different um, cities, and then we had participants from all across the U.S. and around the world, uh, live segments, pre-recorded segments, and things like that. The one highlight was that we took the Cecil B. DeMille 1923 silent film epic, The Ten Commandments, done long before the Charlton Heston film, and together with members of Los Lobos and Flaming Lips, we recorded an original score to that that we premiered that night. That's amazing, amazing. Uh, I have to say my favorite part from, there were a lot of great parts from Dispatches from Quarantine, but uh, when Marion Ross uh, corrects that she's not 91, but 91 and a half, Yes. Um, brought me a great deal of joy. Raj, you know, one thing that I definitely want to cover is, is you know, the, you could see the production level increase, particularly as we went from, from the Disney sing-along one to two. But Graduate Together, I think, really uh, stepped up to a new level using virtual production and integrating, you know, um, footage created by graduating seniors all over the country. But one thing that, you know, so I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about that, about producing content inside what is a more traditional, please, uh, soundstage, you know, having LeBron James stand on a green screen, you know, during this quarantine. What does that mean? And, and what kind of crew did you utilize to uh, support that? I mean, basically on all, all three shows, we were very conscious of, of being socially distant and and really adhering to all the rules from you know the, the LA Film Council and just just as humans like we are we were all in this together. So by the time you know Graduate Together came along after the Disney family sing along to 
Um, the, all three productions were done with done and dusted. And, you know, it, everything was shifting. It's like, oh, Disney family sing along to you. Like we had more production, but by the time we were already thinking of the graduation special, we were kind of, you know, just gearing up to do something different. And because this show was going to be across all four networks and also streaming and picking up steam like every day, like, you know, oh no, CNN wants it. Um, the Obamas are coming in. Like it was just this huge mass of, of people again, really wanting to be a part of that. We, we thought we needed to be in a, in a home base and how we were going to do that. And it was not going to be a Zoom format because everybody was already exhausted from Zoom shows and Zoom format. And we're like, how can we actually do a home base that feels a little bit more like the television show that we're all used to. So XQ had a deal. Uh, they were already working with JR the artist and high school seniors were starting to submit their portraits over Instagram and they were basically getting a JR portrait back. Wow. So he, he developed a filter and we we're like, oh, that'd be really great to actually use. Like I was like, you know, just looking at all the stuff and installations that JR's done around the world. I'm like, what if we could do that virtually? And so we mocked up this model. We're like, let's put it in a 3D space, you know, and again, try to think about tonality. Like it can't be flashy. It's got to feel, you know, it's got to feel right for the people that we're speaking to. This very young group of people that are graduating high school that are not getting a graduation, but we actually get to use the photos that they've taken and put them in our space. And there were literally thousands of them. Those are real pictures that have, were submitted online and we put them in a virtual space. And then the second component of that was when we were pitching it was like, well, nobody really wants to be around people. So how are we going to do any sort of production and not have talent interact with anybody? Like if some, if we're asking somebody to come into a space, we don't necessarily want to violate their quarantine. Like if they haven't been with somebody, we are not going to be the people to ask them to do that. Yes. So you're going to show up in our space. This is how we're going to do it. Everything will be sanitized and we would sanitize in between each person. Uh, but the first mock-up we did was showing LeBron James as he was signing on to the show of what he would look like in that space. And I was like, oh no, you're going to be surrounded by thousands of JR portraits that are real high school graduates. And this is going to look amazing. And we showed him a little test and he said he was in. So after that, as people would come in, we, we decided we really wanted more people in the space. It was Lena Waithe. We, you know, when the Platt brothers decided to do a, an original arrangement, we're like, we really want you in our space. You know, Timothy Chamelet, like everybody was coming to the space, Alicia Keys. So we kept designing and it would be like, oh no, come into the space, we can produce this. And all they would be seeing is green screen. They would never interact with anybody. We had instructions for them, we would, you know, we would check in with their assistants or themselves. They would all be on text and stuff like, have you arrived in the space? It was all laid out for them. There's their mic, you know, there, if they had ears, it was all laid out. They were able to do it themselves in a separate control room was a very small group of people that again was like our audio engineer, our director on site, our tech supervisor and our unreal game engine, uh, you know, person technician that was part of the studio setup. And so they were there in case there were any problems, but, talent would walk in and they never had to see anybody from our production at all. And then everybody else was on Zoom. And we could watch everything that we made in real time. So, you know, Alicia Keys would be playing and there would be the reveal of the thousands of portraits happening. The Platt brothers would be singing and we would be seeing live, you know, all the entire virtual choir behind them and all the musicians, because we had pre-taped that, you know, four days before and composited into the model. So Hamish is directing from London. I'm watching from my home here in Los Angeles. And, you know, our technical director is, is watching from his space and we could all see it live and all they, they're just in a virtual studio with a green screen, having to trust that they are in the right spot that we're telling them to and telling them when that's going to happen. But they, they could not see any of the preview at all. Like that we, we didn't have it set up. And again, we wanted to get people in and out really quickly. You know, we, we didn't want them spending a lot of time if they had trusted us enough to leave their home and come to us. We wanted to make it as easy as possible. And then I think when they saw the end result, they were like, you know, they were blown away with how we were able to produce that in a really short amount of time. Because again, from concept to us having working models and being in the studio was eight days. Wow, incredible. You know, I, 
again, the theme of the night is, is we're running short on time. Um, but, but Raj, before we move on to the next segment, I just wanna, I wanna shine one light on a choice that you made throughout the projects. But during the Platt Brothers uh, performance, you actually dropped the background and you showed the audience that they're standing on a green screen platform in a green screen studio. I thought that was a very interesting choice. How did you come to decide that? Um, it started with Disney Family Sing Along that we, we really wanted to tell everybody at home if you know they were wondering, we felt like we wanted to be very conscious and tell people like, oh no, no, this was done with a really minimal amount of people. Our people were actually doing it themselves or we were exposing how we were doing it. And again, it was kind of a nod to like everybody in the entertainment industry that might watch and be like, well, how did they do this? Like, did they build a set? All the set shops are closed in Los Angeles. Yeah. And we wanted to tell people, it's like, no, no, like this was done with a very minimal amount of people, you know, and, and we wanted to expose it because we thought it was part of the fun. It was like, you know, this whole time of being in quarantine, we wanted everybody to be part of the discussion and we wanted to let people in on, you know, kind of our secrets of how we were doing production. It was awesome. Thank you guys so very much. Uh, we'll be coming back to you for some Q&A at the end. And Chris, if I could just quickly jump in. Uh, I put in the chat for attendees and everyone, um, the Mashable um, Adobe Creative Suite uh, certification bundle, which ordinarily costs $1,600. They've made available really since like April for $34. So that to me, I'm really getting better at After Effects and Premiere and everything else was incredibly useful. And I hope that's something that's helpful. Um, the other thing, and I'm gonna be this guy. So, uh, you know, this panel is about uh, shooting remotely while waiting for the new normal. Um, we've got a panel that's got two women, one black person and one non-black person of color. Um, that's not a good look. And I think that we all really, because we're in an industry that has such a diversity and that these skills and this opportunity to be collaborative and creative as we figure out what social distance content looks like, what uh, content that takes all of these things into consideration is there. I know I'm wanting, uh, I'm not, uh, in paying lip service is not sufficient, but I just really wanna remind all of us and encourage all of us that that's an area where we still need to get out of that quarantine and collectively do better. And I'm committed to improving that in my own practice. And uh, I look forward to seeing others of us do that as well. You know, you started by saying you don't want to be this person, but I hope we're all this person. Um, you know, I, I, we fully agree. And, uh, and, and yeah, and, and, and I hope that I certainly echo what you've said and, and frankly, I've had a lot of conversations with folks on this call um, about, about doing our part in continuing to do that. So that won't stop. Well, uh, it went by very quickly for me. I hope, I hope you think the same thing. In fact, uh, I went the whole night without making a single joke about not wearing pants. And this is the time where I would normally stand up and give everybody a standing ovation, um, but I won't. <laughs> Look, my most sincere thanks to each and every one of you for joining us tonight and sharing your experiences with the Academy. Thank you very, very much. I'd also like to thank the production executive peer group governors, Kieran Fisher and Lucia Gervino, the producers peer group governors, Keith Raskin and Tony Carey, reality programming governors, Bob Bowden and Jill Dickerson, and the interactive media governors, Lori Schwartz and Chris Tomes. Thank you, Chris. A very special thanks goes out to David Hartle, along with Barbara Chase for helping us, as always coordinate these great events. And thanks to David Napoli for providing technical support from the Academy. Thank you everyone so very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Thank you Chris. Chris.